So I'm going to change uh, change gears again a little bit and and talk about two cherry side tables. Um, and and these these both of these tables were were uh, part of an article in Fine Woodworking Magazine, and it was in the January 2021 issue. Um, and if I, I would I would recommend taking a look at that uh, that article um, if you're interested in in these tables or something similar. Um, and if you're not a, a Fine Woodworking member, this this article is on my website. Um, so th this is one of the two tables. And again, both of these tables were part of this article. Um, and the, the reason I ended up building two tables is because I had to build a finished table for photography for the article, but then I also had to have enough extra parts to show, uh, to be able to photograph sort of the process of building the table. And so I finished this table first, uh, and, and the second table I eventually made from the parts that were used in the article. Uh, and here are those two tables together. Rift, uh, the one I call Rift is on the left. That's the first table that I made. Uh, the one I call Quarter is on the right, and that's that's the second table that was made from the from all the uh, the extra parts for the article. And when I finished Rift, um, I, I realized that for my taste, it was a little too quiet, a little too um, unadorned. I, I want, I, and so I knew that when I eventually built the second table, that I wanted to uh, dress it up to give it a little bit of attitude or uh, individuality, uh, just just make something that was a little bit more visually appealing. And and I'll and in a few minutes I'll I'll talk about some of those uh, details that I used to to dress up quarter, um, but before I do I, I there is one uh, sort of decorative element of, of rift that I want to talk about and that is um, well so so I, I should mention the focus of of the article that these tables were built for uh, was to was to make a table with multiple drawers where the grain there was a grain match between the apron, the front apron, and the drawer front, so that the grain would appear to sort of flow from apron to drawer front continuously. And I achieved that um, by taking a solid apron, uh, ripping it into three strips, cross-cutting the middle strip to extract two drawer fronts, and then gluing the remaining pieces back together to create an apron with two openings uh, that were fit exactly to the drawer fronts that I had extracted. Sort of taking that thinking about working with or, or, or wanting to have you know continuous grain flowing from from uh, apron to drawer front, I kind of applied that thinking to the aprons um, of this piece to, to the to the three other aprons, the two side and, and rear aprons, and and I ended up um, laminating veneer to the aprons, uh, and that veneer those those slices of veneer were were sawn from the same piece of material which came from the the, the same um, boards that, that all of these tables were made from. Um, and, and my thinking there was just that I wanted to impart some really nice consistency in, in the grain of the apron. Um, so the idea wasn't necessarily to have it flow around the table, but just to, to add a bit of consistency. Uh, and that's something that I do in a lot of my work. I, I kind of, one of my um, tenets of design, if you will, is, is to control every aspect of a piece and so oftentimes if, if I don't look if I don't like the visual appearance of, of, of a part in a piece of furniture maybe I'll, I'll replace it or maybe I'll veneer over it with something that that is more to my liking in terms of visual appearance um, on on the second table so here we're, we're looking at the second table the the I call it the wild child the one that's a little more visually exciting in, in my opinion um, I, I I didn't I didn't do any laminating to the apron, but I did uh, laminate veneer to the tabletop itself. So this tabletop, if if I recall, it was it was made of quarter sawn material, but it was quarter sawn that was sort of trending to rift sawn. So you were sort of losing some of that really vibrant uh, reflex. And so I decided to uh, saw some veneer from from a really nice uh, quarter sawn piece of material. I, I sawed three slices from it, and then just um, Slip match those those pieces of veneer. Uh, so if you look closely, you, you do see a little bit of a repeating pattern because I did use again uh, three pieces of veneer that were just slip matched. But I think there's also I think if you don't know that that was done, there's also there's enough uh, sort of craziness going on with that uh, curly material and, and with the quarter sawn 
that it's not something that that stands out. And one of my concerns with doing this was hiding the glue line between the veneer and the solid substrate below. And so to to hide that glue line, I ended up doing a pretty heavy chamfer on this top edge. And I, I talked about chamfers a little bit a, a, a little earlier. Uh, and and I I use chamfers in all of my work probably. 95% of, of my of the of the individual parts in my work have some sort of chamfer on them just to soften an edge um, or, or again just to sort of provide a facet that reflects the light slightly differently and in this case I employed that detail uh, a little heavier than I normally would but again I was trying to hide the the glue line between the veneer and the substrate hey, Mike. Well, on these on, on this table, the, the core material is solid cherry. And so so and 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 I refer to the, the process of, of applying that veneer as laminating because the grain direction of the veneer is parallel to the grain direction of the substrate. And this in this case the substrate is solid wood. So they're both expanding and contracting. Um, the rates might be slightly different just because the, the veneer is is, is Pretty much perfectly quarter sawn. The substrate is solid wood that has that is predominantly quarter sawn, but also has some rift sawn to it. But I think the rates of expansion and contraction of those two materials are um, close enough that I, I don't I have no concerns about um, you know sort of differences difference of rates of expansion and contraction. And the same goes for the aprons. When I talked about this table and talked about laminating veneer to the to the aprons, those aprons were also solid cherry. And again, grain, the grain direction of the veneer is parallel to the grain direction of the aprons. And is that pretty typical then of what you do? The the material underneath is similar to what the veneer is. Um, no, I mean it, it sort of depends on, on the application. If if I'm if I'm if I'm veneering, if I'm doing a case piece. Um, and I don't want to. I don't want to deal with expansion and contraction. I mean, I want sort of a, a, a fixed veneered assembly. Then, then I'll, I typically use Baltic birch as a substrate when I when I'm veneering. That's that is one of the details that I use to sort of to dress up the second table that I that I did use on the first table. And and I. Um, I'm, I, I had I will talk about how how I went about, or I'll I'll talk briefly about that detailing um, that, that's coming up fairly soon. Uh, okay, so so I talked about we talked about uh, laminating veneer to to sort of control the the visual appearance of a piece. Um, another detail that differs from table to table is is the legs. Um, on the right is the original table, and that had that had straight legs that had tapers shaped on the two inside faces. And on the second table, uh, the, the legs of, of that table are actually curved outward. So they taper, but they also curve outward. Uh, and the way I achieved those curves, uh, well, I, I achieved those curves through steam bending, um, but the actual process for doing the steam bending differed from any kind of steam bending I've done in the past in two ways. The first is that those legs were actually completely finished. Not, not in terms of applying a finish, but completely finished in terms of joinery and shaping before I steam bent them. So those legs, um, they were straight. They, I, I had shaped tapers on their two inside faces. I had cut mortises for the, the apron joinery up at the top of the legs. Um, and, and all of that stuff was done prior to steam bending. Uh, and another way that, that the steam bending process was, was different for me is that I held the legs, when, when they were bent, I held the legs I didn't personally hold them, but, but the legs were held in a cradle so that the legs were rotated 45 degrees. Um, and this, if, this doesn't, if this description doesn't make sense, I have images coming up. But the legs were held in a cradle and they were rotated so that the diagonal of their cross section was, was vertical. And then the bend was, was done vertical as well. And the net result of that is that they, the legs appear to bend outward in two directions. Right, so um, so th this this is just sort of comparing the two different legs, and I also I'm gonna uh, just so t keep stay focused on the legs. I'm gonna jump back and forth. So here here's the first table, straight legs. 
second table curved legs. And the curves are, are pretty subtle. Um, it's, it's not a heavy curve. And that, that, that's, that's what I was going for. I, I tend to work with kind of subtle details, um, but it, it's enough that, that you can see it. And so here, here is my steam box set up for, for steam bending those legs. Uh, and, and because the legs were finished, um, I didn't want to, again, meaning the joiner, joinery was already cut, I didn't want to stick the whole leg in the steam box because I was worried about steam uh, distorting those, those reference faces where the aprons meet the legs. And also I didn't want the steam to, to distort the, the mortises and change sort of the, the, the fit of, the, of that joinery. So I, I only inserted the legs part way. Um, and I also used a little rubber gasket um, in that opening, and, and there's a square hole cut in the gasket, and, and the hole is slightly smaller than the, the cross section of the leg. So that when I stick the leg in into the into the steam box, the gasket creates kind of a seal around the leg, and, and no steam comes out. And so this is a cr the cradle that I came up with to hold the legs, um, rotated 45 degrees. So you can see it, it's a pretty basic setup. And I, I'm just using some blocks with um, 90 degree V grooves milled in them. And that, that allows me to hold that leg rotated 45 degrees from sort of a normal bending setup. Um, and and there, there are some variables that I had worked out ahead of time through some testing, like the, you know, how, how thick this block was back here, where, where this block was located, and, and again, how sort of how thick that block was. And, and those variables just sort of um, affected the bend, you know, how much bend I put into the leg and sort of where the bend occurred along the length of the leg. So each leg was steamed for about an hour and a half and then brought into my shop. Uh, it was first, you know, clamped into the, the top of the leg was clamped up here. And then I just bent the, the foot of the leg down by hand and then held it in place with a, with a clamp. Um, and, and this material was kiln dried cherry. Um, and I think you know sometimes you can get away with with using kiln dried material when steam bending. Sometimes it doesn't work so well. In this situation, I think it, it worked fine, and I think that's because I, I was just doing a pretty slight bend. You know, I, I wasn't asking the material to bend to to, to take on a, a really extreme bend, so um, it it was it, it didn't struggle at all. And when I took the clamps off, there was some spring back. You can see you can see how much the, that leg has tried to go back to straight. Um, I, I, I tend to think of steam bending as um, a, a sort of an inexact science. Uh, it's, it's not a, I, I don't rely on it for like precision, meaning I, going into this, I knew that the four legs were not going to be identical in terms of their, their final shape just because of that spring back. And it, it, is, it is interesting that just the variability from one leg to another means that they, they all behave slightly differently. Um, but because these legs are at most maybe 12 inches from each other, um, you really can't pick up the, the differences between the legs. I think what's more important is that the, you know, the, the dimension at that foot is, is very consistent between all four legs. And so um, I, I kept each leg clamped for about an hour as the next one was cooking in the steam box. And then here, here we are looking down the length of the leg and, and you can see how you know, the net effect of, of holding that leg in a rotated position means that it, it appears to curve outward in two directions. So the, uh, another detail that I wanna talk about is this, um, what, what, what I would call cock beating around the, uh, the front, around the drawer front. And so I don't, this is not a, uh, what you would call traditional cock beating because the, the, um, the material, which is uh, some, I think it's Indian ebony, it's actually flush to the drawer fronts, whereas traditional cock beating would have a half round profile shape to it and it would, it would be proud of the drawer fronts. Um, but I just chose to go flush for this, just sort of a more maybe contemporary take on, on that detail. And, and, and the one thing I'll say about this is, is that, that the cock beating that, that con of a contrasting material, such a dark material compared to the, the somewhat light cherry just really makes things pop. Um, and I, I really, I really appreciate the, that detail on, on the, this piece. So is that drawer, Mike, uh, veneered? Uh, the whole front of that face, is that veneered no. or is it solid? solid? That is a solid, yep, that is a solid drawer front. And yes, I, I have a cross grain situation, right? Because the, the grain of the drawer front is running horizontal. 
the grain of the of the at least these right. sides, the two side pieces of cock beading are running vertically. Um, but this is this drawer I think is two and a quarter or something wide. So there and it, it's also quarter song. So there's very little movement there. And and I was I was totally comfortable with that that yeah. um, cross grain situation. So when you cut your three boards or your board into three pieces for to make your drawer fit in, did you use did you constant consciously use the beading as taking up the space lost for your saw because i've done this no. before in tables too and you always lose an eighth or three six three thirty seconds with the, your your saw cuts agreed yeah yeah you, you yeah there's no way no way around um yeah losing some material due to due to saw curves um mm -hmm. but no so everything when when everything was glued back together it, it just everything um maybe the best way to say it is every, it, it wasn't a perfect representation of the board before it was sort of right. sliced and diced, right? Perfect so, enough. Yes, yeah, yes we, we lost some material in curves, but when I glued everything back together, I glued it so that those drawer fronts that I had extracted out fit in the opening, you know, pretty much perfectly. Okay. And I, I don't have photographs of um, making the cock beating, uh, and, and I apologize for that, just didn't think to take any when I was doing it, um, but it, it's it, it it can be finicky stuff. Um, probably probably the biggest challenge when doing cock beating is where the sides the, the side pieces um, intersect the top because the, the top piece of cock beating is, is is as wide as the drawer front. The side pieces are are not as wide as the drawer front, and so you end up having to do a little stopped miter cut in here. And in this this ebony, it's just it's it's brittle, it's dense, it's just kind of tough to work. And, and you're working with these teeny tiny little pieces. And and I got about an hour into the into doing this cock beating, and I I was just like kicking myself. I was saying like well, why did why did you do it this way? You know I, I I could have done this as an edging just an edging detail. Um, and I just I hit that point in that first hour where I was just sort of frustrated. Fortunately, I worked through it, and I, I was pleased with with how everything came out. And and I did think about doing it as just an edging detail, right? Where I, I mill maybe sixteenth of an inch by sixteenth of an inch rabbit into the drawer front, and then put in some some inlay or some edging into that. Um, but I I, I thought I, I was I was nervous that I wouldn't like the appearance of the side where you would sort of see a little bit of edging, then you'd see some end grain of the drawer front, and then the dovetails would start. And I, I just I, I I was fearing that I would not like sort of that sort of striped appearance. So the last detail I want to talk about is is uh, the feet of of this table, and so not this table. This is let, let me back up. The, the last detail I want to talk about is the feet of this table, uh, quarter. And my orig originally, I was going to do something like a sock detail, and, and that's that's what I would I would I would call this detail. This is um, a sock, it's, which is basically made by you know adding veneer to the bottom few inches of a table leg. Um, and, and I really appreciate that detail, but it's been done. Um, I've done it. Lots of people do it. And, and and I just decided I wanted to do something different, a little bit different. So I came up with, um, instead of doing a sock, doing the outline of a sock, but but not doing a full veneer like, like the sock detail. And when I was thinking about doing this detail, um, my primary concern was how do I get a nice crisp corner here where, where this uh, this angled inlay meets right here. I, I was I was worried about you know how, how am I going to mill uh, dados and and end up with a really crisp tight corner in there. Um, yeah, and so and and I'll get to that in a second. Um, this this just I just wanted to give one overview of the piece just to sort of again show the effect of that detail on this piece. I think I think it works really well because it it sort of. Uh, it relates to the uh, cock beading on the drawer front, um, and it's you know the cock beading is the same thickness as the as the veneer or excuse me the inlay and the edging on on the bottom of the legs. So the the details kind of relate to each other, which is definitely definitely something that I think about. Uh, that detail again, and so my concern with that uh, again with getting a nice crisp corner in there 
uh, was alleviated by building a, a jig. So this is a jig made out of Baltic burst plywood. There are several uh, dados milled in the jig. I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, and then each, each piece was mitered and then they, uh, glued together. So here's the jig in action. Um, this, this, the ser these series of, of dados accept a piece of MDF, which acts as a fence for a palm router. Um, this series of dados closer, closer toward this end here uh, are really just clearance for the bit uh, that I used. The bit was a quarter inch diameter, excuse me, the bit was a 16th inch diameter, but it had a quarter inch diameter shank. So I just, I just needed some clearance so that the bit didn't, um, didn't make contact with the, with the Baltic birch jig. Uh, so, and, and before I move on, here, the, in this image, the jig is in place, it's, it's clamped to the leg, there's a clamp here, and there's a clamp here, um, and, and I would take up, I, again, I used a palm router, and I would uh, drop the bit into this, this clearance hole, uh, make my cut, and then back it up and, and lift, lift the uh, router off the jig, and there's the end result, and uh, this, this was on a test piece. And there, there's a little bit of fuzz um, from, from routing that, but I, I, I was pleased with the results and, and went, went ahead and um, milled the rabbits on the very ends of the legs and then the rabbits on, on, three, on three corners of each leg. And I did that by using basically a, a mini router table. So I used my palm router and I took off the plastic base and, and attached a piece of Baltic birch plywood as the, to be the, the new base of the router. And then I, um, I ran the bit, I, I think I'm using a quarter inch diameter bit here. I ran the bit or up into the, that Baltic birch uh, base, which created a zero or semi zero clearance situation. Uh, and then I, I clamped this fence in place. And, and I actually, I, I you know, moved the fence into the, the bit as it was spinning again to create a, a zero clearance situation. Um, and anytime I'm doing, a process like this where it's, it's sort of fi a finished detail, I'm always concerned about um, tear out or, or blow out or, or somehow you know, uh, damaging uh, what is a finished part. And then to, uh, to add that, that edging, I, I basically fit one piece, um, one piece at a time, uh, glued the, the, the pieces in, clamped them with blue tape, and then moved on to the next leg. And by the time I had sort of worked through all four legs, I could remove the blue tape because the glue had cured and I could, I could start um, adding the next piece. Um, here, so this piece was glued into place and then I, here I, I flushed it off with a block plane. Then I've added uh, the, the little piece of inlay down at the, down at the bottom of the leg. And, and working in this way was kind of nice because almost every piece I could run long um, and then trim it, you know, sort of cut it flush after it had been glued into place. So I was really only having to focus on cutting one end of each of these pieces really precisely. And at some point I must have changed my process because, you know, all you can see all of these pieces have not been flushed to the leg. So at some point I probably just said, well, I'll, I'll flush these all together at, at the same time, um, maybe just for a little more efficiency or at least speed. And, and the, the methods I used to, to cut all of those little pieces of, of ebony inlay or, or edging um, was, was just hand tool based. It, those, those pieces are too small and it's just too dangerous to try to hold them working at the table saw. So to cut pieces to length or to cut the miters, I, I used a, a pull saw on this miter block. And it's hard to see, but I'm with my fingers, I'm just, I'm holding a piece and you can see it sticking out there, sticking out from the end of the, the miter block. Uh, and then, to, so, so I would use that Japanese pull saw to, to make rough cuts, but then to, um, to make finished cuts, I, I use this, uh, essentially it's like, a, it's like a manual miter trimmer. So it's a, I have, I've got a piece of beach here, which is a nice dense hardwood with uh, complementary miters cut on each end. And then that piece of beach is attached to a piece of Baltic birch plywood. And I would just hold, um, hold the piece of, of edging on, on one of the one of the one of the long faces of the of the beach, and then uh, the back of my chisel would uh, be guided by the uh, the miter cut. And again, it's, it's sort of it's like a manual miter trimmer. If you're familiar with a, a miter trimmer, 
Uh, and here, here are all four legs with the, uh, the inlay and the edging uh, done and, and, and flushed off. And that brings me to the end of my talk. I, I, again, I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to talk about my work. And um, if there are additional questions on, on anything, I'm happy to try to answer them. Yes, Mike, what are, your, what are your, what's your design basis, I guess? Because I, I really like the way, the way your style is. It's, I, I guess I'd call it simple but elegant but it doesn't really fit in any furniture format or anything. So what, what do you call it? And how did you decide to go that way? Um, yeah, I, I have a hard time. Like people ask me like what style I, I work in and I have a hard time answering that because I don't really know. I've, been, I've never been guided by any sort of traditional woodworking. So I don't feel like I'm really influenced very much by any, any work made in the past. Uh, with the exception of, of maybe the shakers, like I think there's maybe, you know, echoes of, of shaker work here. Um, I guess at this point in time, I'm, I'm still trying to sort of find uh, my own design language. I know that I enjoy working with curves and I know when I set out to design a piece, I'm, I'm going for, for something that's very elegant and very refined, but not overdone in terms of detailing and, and ornamentation. Um, so I don't, I think that's the best way for me to sort of describe my design style or my design sense at this point in time. And I like to think it is evolving too. I mean, the more I work with things like veneer and things like curved elements, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to, to sort of take, take those in different directions and explore different ways of using those sorts of, of decorative aspects in my work. You made a big leap in, uh, I'll get to your business part of it a little bit too, giant leap into going from designing CAD, CAD drawings to deciding you wanted to be a woodworker and just doing it. How did you make that step? Uh, so certainly there was some amount of preparation ahead of time. Um, and, and that preparation was for me was more for, was more um, sort of skill building, you know, getting experience in, in woodwork, in woodworking and, and you know the, the type of stuff that I was trying to do um, but really in, in terms of making that jump it was just one of those uh, leap of faith type of things like again I was I was just so unhappy at my day job you know working as a CAD designer that um, it was it was a scary jump you know leaving a, a you know sort of a safety uh, the, the constant, not constant, but the, the regular paycheck and, and going into this. Um, but um, I have a supportive, a very supportive wife. Um, uh, and, and we, and, and, and we just, we just decided that it was, it was worth it to, to try to sort of be happier with what I was doing, uh, as opposed to, you know, wasting my time at a job that I felt that was unfulfilling and, and not providing any sense of happiness. And, and it's, I mean, it's still, you know, I'm still sort of figuring out how to, how to make this um, or, or how to sustain this as a career. And, and that's why I do things like teach at the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship and, and write for fine woodwork, excuse me, for fine woodworking. And I also do still uh, do some amount of uh, timber frame design, uh, not, not a, a, a couple projects a year. Um, but again, I think that idea of like diversification, right? I, I don't, I don't say I'm going to just do furniture, but I do other things that are somewhat related okay. to furniture or at least related to interest from my past. Another question just came in about how do you determine pricing and what are the ranges demonstrated in the pieces you've shown us? How do I determine pricing? So I, I it's, it's, um, I, 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 so I get an idea of how much material I'm going to use, and, and I have some idea of what those materials are going to cost just based on, um, you know, past material purchases. Uh, the big question is usually how much labor am I going to put into a piece? Um, and so I, I come up with a, a, a total number of hours in, in terms of labor, and then I have, I have a, a dollar value assigned to each hour of labor. Uh, and then I also assign, or I also have overhead, um, you know, my business insurance, 
every time I turn on electricity in my shop, there's, there's some cost to me, um, and then profit margin. And so I just, uh, so I, I have a spreadsheet that I use to sort of figure out all those things. Uh, and, and that's how I come up with pricing. Pricing is definitely not easy. Um, it, 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 it's, it's hard to come up with a number and then expect someone to, to pay that number. But uh, I've learned over time that, you know, I, I, don't, uh, I don't apologize for my prices. My prices are not cheap. If you want to work with someone cheap, there are plenty, I think there are probably plenty of people out there who, who, uh, who you can find to do that. Um, but I have just sort of accepted that I, I work fairly slowly. So it takes me a long time to build a piece. Um, but I, I, but, but I, I, that, that is skilled labor that is going into the piece and my, my prices are, are going to be expensive. Um, there was another component of that question. Oh, the, the range of prices uh, shown in the pieces here tonight. Um, I don't know what the range would be. I mean, it, that, that's a, yeah, I'd have to think back. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I can answer that question. Yeah, that's fine. Top of my head, sorry. Well, great designs. Thank you. Mike, how much time do you uh, spend with a client uh, sort of co-designing a piece? Uh, is that an extensive process? Uh, how does that go for you? Um, it sort of depends on the client. Some clients don't, uh, don't want to have very much say in the design, but some, and some clients do. And so you just sort of have to feel it out with each client. Uh, I, I try to, I try to be very communicative, um, unless I I'm getting the sense that like, I'm, I'm, I'm asking too many questions or, or trying to involve them in decisions that, that they really aren't interested in making. And so then I'll, I'll kind of pull back if, if I get that sense. Um, but so, so yeah, I think the, the best response is that it, it's sort of up to an individual for, for me personally, I would rather a client, um, have very little input. Like I, I would much prefer to have, uh, most, if not all of the say in terms of the design, but I also understand that that's, that's sort of not realistic, uh, all of the time, but, but I, I do, uh, I would say for most of my clients, they're very open to my design input and they have, um, they, there may be some aspects of a piece that, that they have an opinion on or or, or want to want to you know have some say on, but for the most part they're comfortable sort of handing the reins over to me, and, and that's an ideal situation for me. So I got a question for you: uh, Were those chairs comfortable? Yes, they were. Yes. Uh, did the were the splats uh, uh, set in place or were they loose so they could uh, uh, flex with the person? They were uh, glued, only, only one end was glued. And I think that was the bottom end was glued into place. Okay. So yes, there was a little bit of flex and they could flex up into the mortises, right. into the uh, crest rail. Cool. Yeah, good, good, yeah. I have, I have a question. Uh, how, how much do you use computer-aided drawing or computer-aided draft of your CAD in your design of your furniture? And do you... Uh, do you plot out uh, full scale mock-ups of different pieces of your furniture or, um, as I know that's possible on CAD. I, I, I worked with CAD myself in my career. Um, I, so I don't always use CAD when I'm designing a piece, but, uh, but I do sometimes. And I, I generally only use it for sort of concept at the concept design stage where I'm trying to sort of work out, um, you know, overall dimensions and, and proportions and, and the scale of all the, all of the different parts. And, and, and I, I oftentimes use CAD for that because I can, you know, draw something in 2D and copy it 10 times and make minor changes to, to those, those other 10 copies and see which ones I like. Um, rarely do I do like a full 3D model in CAD of, of a piece of furniture. Um, I, I am would be more apt to do some concept sort of a concept design in CAD and then go to full scale drawings. Um, just because 
for me, I find that full scale drawings on paper, and when I say full scale, I mean one to one. So if so, if I was drawing this table and it's 24 inches tall, I would draw it 24 inches tall on paper. Um, but I, I find that in, in terms of visualizing a piece, um, it's it's nice to see a piece in CAD, even you know two, a 2D drawing in CAD or even a 3D model in CAD. But I really I find that I have to see it in real life, full dimensions. Um, to really get a sense of the piece. And, that, and that's why I, I will maybe do a little bit of planning in CAD, but then when I start to really get serious about, about dimensions and, and, and specifics of the piece, I go to full-scale drawing, just because I need to see it in three dimensions. 